Egypt, 2,000 years ago. A man is about to be executed, and he's facing a horrible death. His life will be taken by poison, victim of a dark art as old as humanity itself. With their power over life and death, poisons have been coveted throughout history, a bloodless murder weapon with devastating results. For the ancients, poisons were magical. They forced both hero and villain to leave the world of the living and enter the land of the dead. But the once mysterious power of poisons can now be fully explored. Using advanced computer graphics, we can journey inside the human body and unlock the secrets of the lethal chemicals that have so often changed the course of human history. We can learn why some poisons were slow and painful, and why some were instant killers. We can follow the poison's track and witness from the inside its lethal effects. The history of poisoning is a long one. It's no less than the search for the perfect murder weapon. It's humanity's oldest science. What makes a perfect poison? It needs to be reliable and fatal. It should have no color or taste or smell, so the victim suspects nothing, and it should mimic death by natural causes, leaving no clues to suggest foul play. But where to look for such a perfect murder weapon? It turns out that the natural world is a war zone when it comes to toxins, and some of them are deadly. Many plants and fungi produce lethal cocktails of chemicals, and certain animals produce the most powerful toxins known to science. Poisoners throughout history have studied and experimented with these natural agents. Famous figures from ancient history, like Hannibal and Cleopatra, knew all about poisons and how to use them. The dark art of poisoning has long intrigued some of humanity's greatest thinkers, men like Leonardo da Vinci. He worked on one of the world's first chemical weapons, a substance he called Fumo Mortale. It was designed to be hurled at enemy ships, a combination of sulfur, realgar, juice of dogwood berries, arsenic, toad and tarantula venom, all mixed with the saliva of mad dogs. It sounds disgusting, but it was this kind of thinking that got him a job with Italy's most notorious poisoners, the Borgias. Cesare and Lucretia were two of Pope Alexander VI, many bastard children. Their family had come to Italy from Spain, bringing secret poison recipes from Moorish scientists and alchemists. 
ideal for removing political rivals. In Renaissance Italy, poison and politics were inseparable. The Borgias used recipes for poisons so effective and controlled, they still baffle chemists today. Time poisons had a delayed action of several weeks, yet eternity powders would kill in a matter of minutes. One of the most sophisticated recipes was called la cantarella, made by sprinkling arsenic on rotting pig intestines, collecting and purifying the resulting liquid and adding other chemicals like phosphorus. It was said that this was such an effective poison the Borgias usually saved it for their friends. La Cantarella was so deadly because its main ingredient was arsenic. And arsenic has no color, taste or smell. Very easy to slip into a victim's food or drink. Arsenic is a very simple chemical, but it works by blocking the body's most basic process. The body is made up of millions of tiny cells, and every cell contains minute structures called mitochondria, which are the cell's tiny powerhouses. This is where sugar reacts with oxygen to produce the energy needed to sustain life. But arsenic acts like a spanner in this chemical machinery, stopping the mitochondria from producing energy. And without energy, of course, the body dies. So dinner at the Borgias didn't always mean reaching the last course. La Cantarella, the high but undetectable dose of arsenic brought a quick and final end, making arsenic the first serious contender for the perfect poison. But it's not that simple. Arsenic has some other very strange effects. In Austria, the province of Styria built its wealth on smelting iron ore, but the ore was contaminated with arsenic. The poison built up in layers of slag that coated the chimneys of the smelting works. But this didn't seem to worry the iron smelters at all. As soon as the chimneys were cool enough, they would harvest this lethal coating, not to murder anyone, but to eat it. They claimed that the continual low dose of arsenic was good for them. And they were probably right. All poisons seem to have this baffling property. And this was partly understood even as early as the 16th century by the scientist Paracelsus, who wrote, in all things there is poison and nothing is without poison. It is only the dose that determines whether a poison is or isn't poisonous. But in very low doses, many poisons are even more strange. They're not only harmless, they're even therapeutic. So the miners of Styria thrived on their daily dose of arsenic. Yet a few hundred kilometers away in Vienna, their emperor Leopold lay dying from just a slightly higher dose. In the 18th century, Arsenic was added to candle wicks to make them burn brighter. But as they burned, they released arsenic into the air.
This wasn't a problem for those who could only afford a few candles, but burning enough to light a palace could prove deadly. So this great man, who had led his country and survived through the bloodiest of wars against the Turks, could have died simply from sleeping in rooms lit by arsenic-laden candles. Or he might not, and we might never know, because the symptoms of arsenic poisoning are similar to those of gastroenteritis or cholera. So the fact that it mimics a natural disease, as well as being colorless and tasteless, explains why arsenic was called the king of poisons, popular with all kinds of poisoners. And as Leopold lay dying in Vienna, in southern Italy, one woman was making a killing, selling arsenic. Known as La Tofana, she included arsenic in her lethal and very popular special potion. Just a few drops were lethal. Her product was called Aqua Tafana, and she sold it to women as a beauty treatment. But she also gave her customers secret instructions on its real use to dispose of unwanted husbands. It's possible she was responsible for over 600 deaths which makes her one of the greatest poisoners in history. But arsenic isn't a perfect poison. It attaches itself to a substance called keratin, which makes up hair and nails. It gradually builds up in the hair follicles, making the hair brittle, and stays there for years after death. This wasn't a problem in the days of Leopold and La Tofana, but in 1836, English scientist James Marsh invented a test for arsenic, and after that, poisoners would leave a long-lasting trail of guilt. So if Marsh had invented his test a hundred years earlier, we might have known what had happened to Leopold. But even before the Marsh test, there was another problem with arsenic. In all but the highest doses, arsenic acts slowly. So if Leopold had been poisoned, he would have taken a long time to die. So well before his death in 1705, the search was on for something more rapid and deadly. In Renaissance Italy, the country's top minds were focused on inventing a stronger poison. Among his other talents, Leonardo da Vinci turned his genius to solving this problem, with a little help from nature. His idea was called the technique of passages. Feed a poison to an animal, cut out the damaged organs, make a new potion from this, and feed it to another animal. He repeated this four or five times. His theory was that the poison would get stronger every time it passed through one of these unfortunate creatures. History doesn't say whether this worked well enough to kill anyone, but if it had worked, Leonardo would have been 500 years ahead of his time. A more recent accidental experiment showed that poisons can be concentrated like this. In the 1950s and 60s, pesticides like DDT offered the answer to a farmer's prayers. DDT was sprayed onto crops to kill the millions of pests. But other creatures fed on these pests 
or on contaminated plants. And then other creatures fed on them, and so on. The poison passed up the food chain, reaching higher concentrations as it passed through each creature. When it reached the top predators, the poison was strong enough to stop them breeding, or even kill them. Not content with just increasing the strength of his poisons, Leonardo also worked on perfecting the delivery system. A poison needs to be predictably lethal, but seem totally innocent. The victim should suspect nothing. Leonardo tried injecting the barks of fruit trees with poison, assuming that it would be absorbed by the fruit as it developed. And what could be more innocent than a freshly picked fruit? This should have worked. Just think of today's worries about crops accumulating toxins from the soil. But to kill someone would have taken so much fruit, the fruit would have had a more dramatic effect than the poison. In Renaissance Italy, poisoning was so popular that Rome and Venice had their own schools for poisoners. They taught that poisons had many different uses, some deadly and some to enhance the beautiful. When Leonardo wasn't busy with his inventions, he was working on his most famous painting, the enigmatic Mona Lisa. Whoever the woman was behind the painting, she was an aristocratic beauty, and her looks have enchanted people for centuries. Like all women of her time, she would do anything to keep her beauty as long as possible. So she made use of the idea that poisons can be beneficial in very small doses. There was one poison that women of her day understood and used as often as they needed. It was a poison made from a plant, the deadly nightshade. In low doses, this isn't poisonous at all, but a cosmetic. A few drops in the eyes makes the pupil expand, turning Renaissance women into doe-eyed beauties, which is why deadly nightshade is better known as Belladonna, beautiful lady. Unlike arsenic, Belladonna is a very complex chemical, far too complex for Renaissance science to manufacture. But why bother? There are many thousands of plants around the world busy making these lethal cocktails. Aconite, Digitalis, U, hemlock, and their different properties have been known to poisoners for centuries. The ancient Greeks used hemlock for executions. This sentence was passed on Socrates for daring to hold views that contradicted the state. But it was an honorable way to die, so Socrates carried out his own execution. The complex chemicals in hemlock work in a very different way from arsenic. They target the junctions between the nerves and the muscles. Normally, electrical impulses travel down the nerves and trigger contractions in the muscles. But hemlock stops these signals reaching the muscles. And with no input from the nerves, the muscles just stop working.
At first, hemlock causes a lack of coordination, then a growing paralysis, until finally, the heart and lungs stop working forever. All the classical civilizations understood how to use plant toxins. 200 years after Socrates' death, the great general of Carthage, Hannibal, sat in the palace of King Prusias in what is today northern Turkey. He'd won some great victories in his life, including a surprise attack on the Roman Empire with his war elephants. When he was finally defeated by Rome, he fled to Turkey, and rather than be handed over to the Romans, he decided to end it all. Hannibal used a deadly cocktail of plant poisons. He mixed hemlock with aconite, which compounds the effect of hemlock. As the aconite started to work, Hannibal would have felt a burning sensation spreading from his mouth. The hemlock poisons will soon start to block the nerve impulses to his muscles, including the muscles of the heart. Meanwhile, the aconite attacks the nerves and muscles of the heart directly. Normally, electrical impulses along the nerves and muscles are created by charged particles moving in and out through carefully regulated holes. But aconite disrupts this system, allowing particles to flood through the holes uncontrolled. The electrical signals that control the regular beat of the heart muscles lose strength, adding to the growing effect of the hemlock, making the heartbeats weaker and weaker until the heart finally stops dead. But plants don't make poisons for people. They do it to stop animals eating their precious leaves. But that doesn't always work. Some insects can neutralize the plant's poisons and devour their toxic diet without a moment's indigestion. Many of these insects use the plant's toxins for their own purposes. Cinnabar moth caterpillars feed on ragwort flowers and leaves, which contain toxic alkaloid poisons. Not only do the caterpillars thrive on this foul-tasting diet, they store the toxins in their bodies, making them just as distasteful and poisonous as the plant. And they advertise this by wearing orange and black warning colors. The bright red and white colors of this mushroom, the fly agaric, are also a warning. Beware of deadly chemicals. Yet all over the world, people searched out the fly agaric, preparing it as food or drink. The toxins are normally lethal, but in low doses, they produce some very strange effects. In northern Siberia, the Koryak people brewed up dried agarics for special occasions. One of the first witnesses to these strange parties was Philip von Schalenberg, an 18th century Swedish army officer held prisoner by the Koryak. To pass the time in captivity, he took detailed notes. The rich ones among them stock up on these mushrooms for the winter. 
When they celebrate, they pour water over the mushrooms and boil them. Then they drink the soup, which intoxicates them. Those who cannot afford to lay in a store of these mushrooms post themselves on these occasions around the huts of the rich and watch for the opportunity of the guests coming down to make water and then hold a wooden bowl to receive the urine, which they drink of greedily, as still having some virtue of the mushrooms in it. By this way, they also get drunk. One of the ingredients of fly agaric is a chemical called muskimole, which has some very interesting effects on the brain. Muskimole acts on the junctions between nerve cells, the synapses. It blocks the action of a brain chemical, which controls the transmission of signals between nerves. Without this filter in place, the nerves fire randomly, creating spectacular hallucinations. One common sensation is that of flying high over the ground. And it's not just people who get hooked on this mushroom. The Koryak are reindeer herders, and they discovered that their reindeer would flock to a few small pieces of dried mushroom scattered on the ground, or even the urine of someone who had eaten the mushroom. It was an easy way to gather in the herd, though what effect it had on the reindeer, that's anyone's guess. But von Strahlenberg was wrong to suggest that the Koryak just used the mushroom to get drunk. It's much more important. Their healers, shamans, drank the brew to induce a trance, giving them the power to fly in spirit to distant villages and cure the sick. And these mushroom-induced flights could be the source of a much more familiar image from Northern Europe. Flying reindeer pulling Father Christmas through the night sky. His red and white clothes are thought to symbolize the red and white agaric, and his magical flight is an echo of the shamanic flights of Siberian healers. And for Siberian shamans, the only way into the winter houses was through a hole in the roof. So perhaps this familiar image of Santa has its origins with Siberian tribes and the little red and white mushroom. And plant poisons shaped another of our classic fairy tale images. Witches flying through the night sky on broomsticks. Witches knew a great deal about poisonous plants. And to many people, they were simply healers or herbalists, with a good understanding of how different doses of poisons work. And like the Siberian shamans, they used plant toxins, henbane, belladonna, and datura, to make an ointment that induced the hallucination of flying. but it's how they applied this ointment that created today's familiar image of the witch. In 
in Kilkenny, Ireland in 1342, Lady Alice Keiteler stood accused of witchcraft. A report written at the time stated, when searching the lady's room, we found an ointment which she used to smear on a stick upon which she rode, galloping through thick and thin. This account suggests that witches applied the ointment by using a stick, perhaps a broomstick, and straddling it. Chemicals applied to a mucous membrane are absorbed and passed to the brain more quickly than by other methods. They understood that a poison's effect partly depends on how it's delivered to the body. And the same was also true, the perfect murder weapon. But however it's given to the victim, it must seem innocent. According to legend, the kings of ancient India had invented the perfect delivery system. They were said to keep girls called vishkanyas, poison damsels. From birth, the girls had been fed with a low dose of poison, which was supposed to make them lethal with a single kiss. Did it work? We'll probably never know. But something similar does happen in nature. When it was a caterpillar, this monarch butterfly spent its life feeding on poisonous milkweed plants. But despite the complete remodeling that turned it into a butterfly, it still retained all those poisons in its body. So although the butterfly only sips nectar, it's still as distasteful and poisonous as the caterpillar, advertising this to the world with its orange and black wings. Not all animals have to steal their poison from plants. Some make their own. Female bees are armed with a sharp sting connected to a large poison gland, which makes a toxin called melatin painful enough for beekeepers to need protective clothing and to arm themselves with smoke guns. Smoke makes the bees less aggressive, allowing the beekeeper to check the hives. Beekeepers still get stung, quite often. When she stings, the bee leaves behind her poison sac, complete with muscles that keep working, pumping melatonin into the bloodstream. Once inside the body, the poison damages cell membranes, killing the affected cells and creating a painful inflammation. Although no one enjoys getting stung, this poison has its benefits. According to statistics, the small doses of melatonin received by beekeepers make them more resistant to inflammatory diseases and the common cold. So perhaps melatonin will soon be as useful to people as it is to bees. But some animal toxins have already been put to much more imaginative uses. 
blister beetles protect themselves with a chemical called cantharidin, which causes severe irritation of the mucous membranes, a powerful burning sensation and swelling in the genitals. This gave some people the idea that cantharidin was an aphrodisiac. Dried and ground up beetles made a powder called Spanish fly, which held great promise for a notorious sexual enthusiast like the Marquis de Sade. On one infamous occasion, he'd organize an evening's entertainment with some young women and the liberal supply of Spanish fly, disguised in sweets. De Sade hoped the cantharidin would remove any inhibitions the girls might have. But cantharidin isn't an aphrodisiac. In high doses, it's a lethal poison. All de Sade succeeded in doing was giving one of the girls acute stomach problems. The Saad fled the scene, and the girls reported him to the authorities, convinced they'd been poisoned. At the time, there was no way to detect cantharidin in the body. But on the evidence of the girls, de Saad was convicted in his absence. As he'd completely disappeared by then, the French authorities had to make do with hanging a straw effigy instead. Blister beetles and bees use their poisons for defense. But nature, through natural selection, is also searching for the perfect killer poison, for attack. Creatures like centipedes, sun spiders, and scorpions use poison for hunting. So they need the same from their poison as human poisoners. It needs to be quick and lethal. And since nature's quest has been going on for millions of years longer than ours, some animals have evolved some very powerful toxins. This is a sore-scaled viper, and it's responsible for more human deaths in Africa than any other snake. But that's just collateral damage. Its poison, made by modified salivary glands, is really designed to paralyze the prey as quickly as possible. This poison is a complex mixture of chemicals, and the delivery is by injection. Two hollow fangs and a lightning strike. Once inside the mouse, the venom breaks down the walls of the blood vessels, causing massive internal bleeding. The trauma quickly stops the heart while the poison begins to digest the mouse even before the snake tracks its victim to its final resting place. And the snake can enjoy its meal without the mouse struggling.
humans, in their ongoing search for better poisons, are far too ingenious to let such a powerful poison go to waste. In 30 BC, Cleopatra, magnificent queen of Egypt, had been defeated by Rome. She'd lost most of her power, and Augustus, emperor of Rome, would do anything to savor his triumph. Better to end it all than let him have his way. And Cleopatra had plenty of poisons to choose from. She could draw on 1,600 years of Egyptian research. In the 19th century, a papyrus was found buried with a mummy in Luxor in Egypt. It was dated to 1552 BC and was found to be the oldest known treatise on medicine. But as well as information on various diseases, it contained over 700 recipes for potions and poisons. What should Cleopatra use? Strychnine. No, that distorts the face into a horrible grimace and would destroy her famous beauty. Cyanide from peach stones or extracts of belladonna, all too painful for the great queen. So she finally decided on a lethal and quick-acting cocktail of proteins made by a snake. But the toxin from a viper's bite is excruciatingly painful. So she probably used an Egyptian cobra or asp partly because the asp was sacred to the ancient Egyptians, and partly because cobra venom has a very different effect on the body. the nervous system, stopping electrical signals reaching the muscles. It quickly causes paralysis, then death by suffocation. Much less painful than viper venom, but often more potent. Animal toxins are amongst the most powerful known, and hidden deep in the rainforests of Central and South America are some of the most lethal poisons of all. They ooze from the colorful skins of poison frogs. know all about these frogs. They use the toxins on their blowgun darts, making them lethal in hunting. But there's a mystery surrounding these poisons. When the frogs are held captive, the poison loses its power. It could be something in the frog's natural diet that makes the poison so powerful. Maybe an insect that we haven't yet identified. An insect even more poisonous than the frogs themselves. And that's a sobering thought, as this frog, Philobates terribilis, is currently the most toxic animal known on the planet. 
the poison from this one tiny frog's skin could kill 20,000 mice or eight full-grown men. But poison frogs do have a rival for the most powerful toxin, in the ocean. Puffer fish contain a poison called tetrodotoxin, gram for gram, 10,000 times more deadly than cyanide. Yet people eat puffer fish. Called fugu by the Japanese, it's only prepared by the most highly trained chefs, since one fugu contains enough poison to kill 30 people. Most of the poison is concentrated in the liver and ovaries, so the fish is dissected very carefully. In the past, a fugu chef would be executed if any of his customers died. The skill is to leave just enough poison to make the fugu experience work. Different dishes at a traditional fugu feast contain different amounts of tetrodotoxin. Fins of the puffer fish, soaked in sake, are relatively safe. Other dishes have higher concentrations, enough to provide the mild numbness and tingling, which is the aim of the fugu connoisseur. Without realizing it, diners at fugu restaurants put more faith in Paracelsus ideas than anyone else, because the tingling is caused by the tetrodotoxin acting as a nerve poison. It blocks the channels in the nerve walls that allow charged particles to pass, stopping the nerves from firing. This makes it instantly fatal in all but the smallest doses. Yet here, tetrodotoxin is used for the thrill of a chemical form of Russian roulette. The excitement of taking a risk. But even today, such poisons are still used as murder weapons. On September the 11th, 1978, Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian journalist, was making his way across London. Four days later, he would die an agonizing death. And all he remembered was being jabbed in the leg by an umbrella. looked as if he'd simply died of natural causes. But in the autopsy, something was found in his leg. A tiny metal sphere the size of a pinhead. It seems he was assassinated, but with what? No traces of toxins were found in his body. Had somebody finally come up with the perfect poison? The best guess was that he'd been poisoned with a rather nasty chemical called ricin. This destroys tiny structures inside the cell called ribosomes. These are where the genetic code is translated into new protein molecules, the building blocks of life. Ricin binds to the ribosomes and cuts off this vital process. Yet despite its catastrophic effect on the basic mechanics of life, it's almost impossible to detect ricin in the body. So it seems to meet the conditions for the perfect poison. Highly toxic, symptoms that don't look like poisoning, and it's cheap and easy to obtain. That makes it popular with modern poisoners. Ricin stockpiles have been found in terrorist hideouts in Afghanistan. And in an echo of the Renaissance days of poison and politics, it's been used recently to attack the heart of the US government. 
Envelopes containing the deadly poison ricin have been discovered in a U.S. Senate mailroom. Congressional and law enforcement sources said the substance was found on Monday afternoon on an automatic mail sorter in the Dirksen Senate office building. A specialized marine unit Ricin deals with might be the latest step in the search for the perfect poison. But it's still not perfect. It's not as toxic when swallowed as it is when injected directly or inhaled as tiny particles. And neither of these delivery systems is as easy as just feeding poison to a victim. So after thousands of years, the macabre search still goes on. Yet despite all the gruesome deaths, almost all poisons have turned out to be useful remedies as well, improving the quality of life, not destroying it. Even ricin may be used in the future to target and kill only cancer cells. Cantharidin from blister beetles and venom from certain snakes could also help in the fight against cancer. Scorpion venom suppresses the immune system, vital in organ transplants. Tetrodotoxin from pufferfish is used to ease withdrawal symptoms from drug addiction. Poison frogs are providing painkillers more powerful than morphine, but without the side effects. The list goes on. Everything that we've found shows that Paracelsus was right. The search for the perfect poison has led to the discovery of many near-perfect medicines, producing more benefit than harm to humanity.